On today's episode of Breast Cancer Stories, we're bringing you an episode of another podcast called Cancer You Thrivers. Kristen was a guest on this podcast, and we're bringing you this episode in its entirety. You can find more episodes of Cancer You Thrivers on Apple Podcasts, and there's a link in the show notes to hear more stories. Today's podcast guest is Kristen Vengler. Kristen talks about cancer never being done. It's one of the things she wished she had known at the beginning of her cancer journey and something she thought she would have seen with her own mother. Stay tuned for this episode. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Oh, good morning. I am so excited to be here. So this is very recent for you. So you can you take us back to the beginning? How did you even find out you had breast cancer? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's very recent. Um, so uh, I had just relocated to San Diego from Austin, and I had been on um, a meditation retreat. I found a beautiful spiritual community. It was 2020, the weekend, Sunday before Thanksgiving. And I was just taking a shower and all that. And um, I noticed that my right nipple felt different than the, than the left when I was, when I was washing. Right. right. And it felt different in that it felt a little larger and it felt um, numb. Really? Like there was no feeling. Did yeah. it look and that's different? not a place that's usually numb. Well, um, yes, okay. but I, but not really noticeably. So the tumor ended up being right behind the nipple. And so what had happened is that the tumor had actually come through. <gasps> and the only, oh I know, <laughs> it was, well, and I, I it felt different. And I, I looked down and the big thing that was different for me is there was a little bit of an indentation, like right on the areola. Hmm. And so, it, and, and it was like on the bottom left. So I grabbed my camera, of course, and took pictures and of both so that I could compare them and see what was different. And there was just a little, a little pink, teeny, teeny little growth um, that looked different. And then there was this indentation. So of course, what do we do? <laughs> Go to Google, yeah. right? And <laughs> diagnose ourselves. <Back> to <laughs> Always. And so um, I looked it up and looked for pictures and all of that. And it said uh, that it was likely something called Paget's or Paget's disease, which was something that was uh, pretty serious, which was a cancer of the nipple. But it didn't necessarily mean that it, it was like a, it was a very rare kind of cancer, this Paget's. So, of course, I diagnosed myself with that and got in to see my primary care and um, went for a mammogram. And they didn't see anything, um, except they saw what was going on on the outside. And so they went ahead and did an ultrasound, didn't find anything. I know. I know. So they sent me to, um, so lucky that um, MD Anderson has a campus out here as of like five to seven years ago. And it was six miles from my house. So um, I was referred to, um, to Dr. Rivera my amazing surgeon and he did a biopsy and he's the guy who had to give me all the bad news all the time. Like he's the nicest man. He shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> and so he did the biopsy and it came back that it was stage three, um, breast cancer. And I was like stage three, I had a mammogram 18 months ago, like a 3d mammogram. Yeah. Like how, how, you know? Um, and so like, of course, he he blasted out all the referrals, you know, to the oncologist. Now, this is December 18th that I was diagnosed. So it's a week before Christmas, 2020. And I was like, you know what? You just couldn't quit 20, 2020, could you? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. you had to just keep giving, keep. right? Yeah. And so, I mean, so he, he was able to uh, get me in to see my oncologist and a radiation oncologist and like the whole thing. And it was this crazy labyrinth of things that places and appointments and all of that, that I had to navigate. Um, and it was so fast. I didn't really even have time to think about it. So, um, all we really knew is that it was, um, a stage three carcinoma. 
And so then, of course, they went back and did all of the the diagnostics and the pathology to find out exactly what we were looking at. And um, one thing I will say is that I was a little bit like a bulldog <laughs> when I was, um, I, if they couldn't get me in for the MRI for two weeks, I was, you know, I, I wasn't rude or anything. I just said, you know what? I said, I was just diagnosed with breast cancer like a week ago. Is there any way that you can get me in earlier? I am so freaked out right now and was just honest and vulnerable, you know, and that my voice probably cracked and people really worked with me to get me in as, as soon as they could. And if they didn't have anything, they said, okay, call back at these times, because this is the most likely time someone will cancel yeah. or that we'll have something available. So, I mean, that's really it in a nutshell, how, um, how I found it. And, um, I'm still a little bit terrified. So <laughs> that, what was the or, next step? Though? You know, Did they do surgery oh, or, and you were going to tell us how big it was too. Oh, um, so the, in the MRI, the, it was 2.7 centimeters. So about an inch and three quarters. Okay. And it was kind of a, an oblong mass. Um, and so the first step was, um, I met with my oncologist and she drew it out for me in record time. And it was um, five months of chemo and then surgery. And I chose a mastectomy because I, I think most, the biggest reason I chose the mastectomy was probably because I could see it mm -hmm. and um, feel it. Did you do a single bilateral mastectomy? Bilateral. You did. Bilateral. I didn't want any breast tissue left. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I could have saved my left nipple and all of that, but I was, I was so freaked out that I could actually like see it. I just didn't want any breast tissue left. And because of the location of it, it would have been a, um, a unilateral for sure right? because of uh, how big it was and where it was, they weren't going to be able to save much of the breast and it would have been just not good. Right. So yeah. So I, um, what was the actual cancer? Was it a type of adenocarcinoma or what was it? Um, it was, um, it was stage three, um, inductive, um, uh, IDC is what they call it. Um, uh, and it was, um, estrogen positive, okay. which the doctors love that because they know there's something they can do with it. Right. That, you know, the treatment, the hormone treatment, um, I, I've made some adjustments to, you know, my, my style of living to keep the estrogen out of my body and, and all of that stuff. And I take a, um, aromatase inhibitor, which it helps keep the estrogen out of my body because yeah. Okay. So, um, let me go back my estrogen side. Cause I love yeah, details. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no. So um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can go back. Why chemo? Because it's so every, as many similarities as there are, there are differences. So why was right. chemotherapy recommended before surgery? Well, that was what um, th everybody asked me that. They're like, what? Like, don't you, don't you want to get that, that tumor out? And so um, it was because the hope was to shrink the, the shrink that to shrink the tumor. Right. And so really quick backstory. My mom had um, ovarian cancer okay. and she had chemo um, in a port directly into like the pelvic area and she ended up getting rid of the cancer, but died of the effects of the chemo oh, after 10 years. It was a brutal situation. So chemo in my mind is like, oh, there's no way in hell. No, right. no, just take it off. Right. And um, in fact, I, you know, I asked her, I said, um, I don't mean to be rude because I know that you're the expert on this, but well, if I'm just taking them off, then why do you want to shrink the tumor? Yeah, what's that the point? Seems... What's the point in doing, right. especially doing that first? Right. And what she said was, my hope is not just to get rid of your cancer for now, it's to cure it. And while it doesn't make sense on the outside, I'm trying to, to get any micro cells that might be floating around, um, you know, in your lymph system and that may have like breast, breast cancer cells that may have landed on your liver, you know, like little micro ones that nobody can see right now on the MRI or CAT scans or PET scans. But in five years, maybe you see, you know, a few little cancer cells growing because these micro cells were still alive. So I understand why chemo, but why chemo before surgery? That's the part I can't wrap my head around. 
I know, I know that I didn't, I didn't, I, I don't know if it was the fear that maybe the, um, or the theory that maybe the uh, micro cells, like the longer you leave the micro cells in there untreated, okay. the more they could grow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't really get it. In fact, um, after I left her, I think I saw her on December 30th <laughs> and I went home and I wrote a, a note to her office through our portal that we have. Um, and I just said, you know what? I said, I understand that you're the expert on this. I said, I just think it's really, really irresponsible <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic for me to be doing chemotherapy and breaking my immune system down. It's an unprecedented situation yeah. and I'm going to opt for the mastectomy first and copied my surgeon on it, all of that. And then I started thinking about it. And well, the nurse from my surgeon's office called and said, okay, Kristen, I understand. I'll have Dr. Rivera give you a call next week. Um, you know, you just need to go through this in, in your way. Right. And Sunday night, I realized I was probably going to have to explain this to my surgeon and explain it to the oncologist and that they were MD Anderson professionals. And I was just sitting here in my fearful place, <laughs> you know, questioning okay. yeah. things. So I wrote a note back that said, um, you know, I realize that you guys have a much more extensive history of curing cancer and treating cancer than I do. So I'm going to go ahead and go with the chemo first and I'll, you know, okay. I'll go ahead and refer to the experts. But I had to go through that process, you know, because I was so afraid. Yeah. And of this was before there were any vaccines out or anything like that. And so nobody really knew what was happening with vaccines and we knew something was coming. Right. But we weren't really sure. So, um, yeah, so that and, and I and I did tell her, you know, I have a, a healthy hesitation um, about doing chemo because of my mom's situation. Yeah. And she said, I understand. And that's something that um, that, you know, I want to answer all your questions. I want you to be comfortable with this, even though it's the most uncomfortable situation you can imagine. So. So you, that, you that was, do the five rounds of chemo? I did. Well, in the five months. Five months, right. Five it months. Was, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. And how did yeah, that um, go? Started on, mm, I didn't look as bad without hair as I thought I would. <laughs> okay. I love <laughs> to that be that's honest. the first place you went. That's awesome. <laughs> um, my labs, I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of work. Like, I know people think this is kind of woo-woo, but a lot of soul work. And a lot of work on, and I had done a lot of work on trauma prior to this. Oh, and I had a really, yeah, I had a really good um, spiritual group. And I had a just a, I really realized that this was not in my control. And so I didn't battle it. I was just like, I got to go do this. And I was kind of a robot because I had so many appointments. And so I started the chemo on January 11th. And I did um, four rounds of what's called AC chemo. They nickname it the Red Devil yeah. because, yeah. And so I had, so it was every two weeks uh, for eight weeks. And then I did 12 weeks of uh, Taxol. Okay. And um, the, the last four weeks of that, there was literally a, um, a ransomware hack throughout the healthcare system oh, that I'm involved in here, oh, God. right? <laughs> I mean, to the point where they couldn't see our records to tell me how, <gasps> to, for them to know how much chemo to give me. Oh, my Everything was electronic. God. Well, this, ha this happened in the last, it was like the last month um, of my chemo. Wow. And, 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 and when I was having all of my um, consultations and pre-op appointments. Right. For with, surgery. I, I was meeting my plastic surgeon and he was, couldn't see anything. And so he, <laughs> for him to figure out what he could do and they were all taking copious notes and my heart went out to them. I could not imagine, you know, and so, uh, they actually postponed what my chemo by one week. I was up the, climbing the walls. I was like, okay, May 24th has been the date in my in my brain that I have been working toward. That's the last day of my chemo, I, right? Like I've been working for this. That's the bell day. That's, right. you know, and I was upside down. Um, now that I look back at it, I'm like, oh my God, you're crazy. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was postponed by a week and um, not a big deal, but it was to me, I was, it was just, I had so focused on that date to be done because it, it's just like, 
that's kind of in this whole journey what it's like you work toward little goals and you just chunk these things right. and and you want to get to this and through this and um I'll go back to how chemo was for me um I the first round an AC was rougher uh than the taxol okay. um I was shocked so I um I'm a retired teacher and my immune system was like a bull. I mean, like swine flu, no big deal, right? And so I had built my immune system over so long. And within a week and a half, I had three infections oh. of just, just like various bacteria that we all have in our body, right? Um, so the chemo was, so I, that, I was really worried because from what I understand, the people like... Um, well, you had this experience with your mother, right? So you had knowing what happened to oh, her, watching it, seeing right. it. So I can understand that that fear. I mean, three, well, three yeah. infections right away is scary. It was really scary. And, you know, I um, what they tell you is that your reaction to the first round is kind of a model for the way the rest of your chemo is going to go. I was really good at keeping ahead of the meds. So oh, I didn't good. wait till I was nauseous or anything Smart. like that. Um, yeah, I just, and, and I, cause I just thought when I had an ACL replacement, you know, I was just, I knew I was supposed to stay ahead of the pain. Right. And so I just kind of applied that here. Um, probably for me, the worst part um, wasn't the going, wasn't the, feeling poorly. It was the amount of sweating I did at night and the lack of sleep that I had. Um, I would change my pajamas three times because I would wake up just in pools of sweat because my body was trying to get rid of this poison, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, and I had, um, I, I was so lucky that I had, um, a group of people who made sure that I had food. Um, and because they said, what can we do, you know, beforehand, you know, and, and I just said, I know myself and I will be too tired and too preoccupied to eat healthy. Yeah. So I had people slicing up, uh, you know, vegetables and fruits and stuff like that. That's, and I could just combine them and that's wonderful. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So that was super helpful. Um, and so I would say that was probably the worst part. And then the unknown, you know, that. I, I just didn't know what was going to happen. And I was in, um, I was in action mode, you know? And so it, and I think it's because it made me feel like I had some kind of control of course. over something that you can never have control over, yeah. you know? And, um, and so I had, um, friends, um, everybody kind of took turns taking me to and from chemo. They wouldn't let me go alone. And I think it's really good because on those days when I was like, oh, no way I'm going, you know, um, or do I have to really go? Um, there, I was, somebody was depending on, you know, depending on me to show up someplace right. or that I was going to come out of my house. And so, um, I think another huge feeling was just disbelief. As I sit here now, almost two years out from that, I still don't really believe I had breast cancer. I mean, I still, I see my breasts, my, you know, that I, they're reconstructed, that I don't have nipples or anything yet. And I see that every day and I still don't think I've processed all of it. Um, and that I'm never going to be the same. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so, and I, well, the other thing too, is it was during the pandemic. So I couldn't have anybody with Which me. Which sucks. And is yeah. Don't even get me started. Sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, you know, it, in, in a way it, it gave me time to really reflect and to, um, to feel like, um, just to work through it during that time or just to relax or whatever, whatever I was supposed to do, um, you know, to heal myself. Yeah. And my, my chemo chair was like looking out at the Torrey Pines golf course and over to the ocean. And so I just, <laughs> pretty sweet I, I know it there's is. a, yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a lot, a lot worse kind of thing. Yeah. And so, the, yeah. And so then, um, so let's jump to your surgery. Yeah. You yeah. have a bilateral, a bilateral, uh, mastectomy. Mastec uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. sounds like you chose reconstruction. Uh huh. So talk to us about the surgery and, and how that went. Sure. Well, um, California opened up from the pandemic, like a week before my surgery. So 
I was like, oh my gosh, that means I can have somebody with me. Cause you know, right. So important. Mm, well, it didn't get to happen. Um, and so that was, that was a hard piece. Um, I also, the, the place that, that they did the surgery was at Scripps, um, Green Hospital. Um, it's an ambulatory sur- uh, uh, surgery center, which I didn't understand what that was, where you like literally walk into your own surgery. And that was interesting because I thought I would be wheeled in and just, you know, um, so I was, I was ushered into the room um, and, you know, um, sat in a recliner and the nurse got me ready and all of that. And my plastic surgeon, Dr. Pachella, and my oncology surgeon, Dr. Rivera, who are both incredible human beings as well as like top of their, top of their game professionally. Um, they came in and drew the lines and it was really cool to see them collaboratively working. Um, so Dr. Pacella was drawing the lines and Dr. Rivera was, was helping to figure out, you know, where he, how it had a, it was a skin saving mastectomy. So they, I knew that the nipples were being removed and all of that. Um, and so it went really well. Um, I didn't, the only thing I really had a hard time with is, um, I was in an incredible amount of pain for about two hours afterward. And it's just, um, it it went away afterward, you know, but I woke up in in incredible pain. And so it just, I I know everybody has different pain thresholds and responses to pain and all of that. So that was just mine. And it's kind of a fog. I think, um, I'm grateful for it and on purpose. Um, the first, I was there for two nights. Um. And I remember people coming in and out and all of that. Um, and I will never forget th- this moment. My um, oncology surgeon, Dr. Rivera came in and he said, um, I really need you to hear me. And I said, okay. And he said, um, this isn't the outcome we wanted. And I know. What? And he said behind it, he, yeah. So he's behind a mask and, I, and so I can't see his whole expressions or anything. And he said, um, we did, uh, they did something called a sentinel, a sentinel, uh, biop- sentinel no biopsy, which means that they, um, during the actual surgery, they actually inject some radioactive dye into the tumor to see where, it, wh- which lymph nodes it goes to first. Right. And then they, they take that lymph node and they biopsy it right there. And so he said, um, the lymph node that we biopsied um, did show cancer. And I said, okay. And he said, so we, um, we took, I don't, he, he doesn't even know how many nodes he took at that point in time. Cause it's hard to know. He said, um, when the pathology gets back, I will get, you know, I, I'll call you. We'll talk about it. And he was very compassionate, you know, um, with it. Um, but he said, I, I just, I need you to sit with it. You know, we were really hoping there was no lymph node involvement. That doesn't mean it's the end of everything. It just means this isn't the ideal outcome. Right. And you may as well have told me that I had stage four pancreatic cancer, brain cancer, all of the things together. Because, um, of course, I didn't dig into this with breast cancer. I knew everything there was to know about ovarian cancer, right? And that I spent my whole life avoiding ovarian cancer, right? Never thinking about the breast cancer. And so... Um, he, uh, so I sat there and, and I was just like, oh, stage three lymph node involvement. Um, history. You know, um, this is going to be a rough couple years. And I, that's wrong. Anybody who's listening to that, I was so um, uneducated. And I don't mean it's in a negative way, but truly ignorant to what that yeah. really, really meant, you know. And so then um, I I went home after a couple days and was in a lot of pain, but stayed ahead of the pain, you know, with the pain meds and all of that. And was not, re- I didn't really realize that it was true, that I would be like, a, um, uh, what's the dinosaur? Um, it's a pterodactyl that has the short arms. Uh, you know what I'm T-Rex. talking about? T-Rex. That's it. Yeah, a T-Rex. T-Rex. A T-Rex. Because I couldn't move my arms um, because of, you know, where the, like, because they, they took so much breast tissue. Um, and I mean, it was like, everything was just, it was wrapped. It was. Um, Did you have tissue? It was exactly expanders? what they told me. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. They put in, they put tissue expanders in, um, and that wasn't super comfortable. I was going to ask, um, was that painful? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. And I never asked, but it felt like 
So the tissue expander, for anybody who doesn't know, is basically it's a placeholder for your um, for your implants. Right. And we knew pretty early on that radiation was on the program. You did. Okay. And so my mm -hmm. and so my plastic surgeon um, allowed for that. So he's worked very closely um, with. I mean, it really felt to me like the, the tissue expander that is flat on the bottom. It's like a it's like a half a grapefruit. Basically, okay. all right. Um, and and the tissue expand on the bottom part. I feel like it was stitched into my chest wall because if I moved, it was excruciating. That was the it worst pain. Was. Was like try, yeah. I, be, I bet it was. You know, um, and just trying to get into a position where I could get up. I actually had a step stool to get into bed, and I'm a side sleeper, so I had to learn how to sleep on my back. Oh. And so I had a wedge and all kinds of pillows and every, I called it my pillow throne because I literally, it was like I built a recliner into my bed. Nice. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I didn't even think I could go get a recliner, you know, but I built it into my bed. And so um, it was super important to have my arms um, elevated. Yeah. So, so there wasn't a lot of pulling also. So um, the recovery on that was exactly what they said it would be. Um, I, what they were doing is that they were injecting saline periodically into the uh, expanders to, um, and they were over the muscle um, to make the, to make room for the implants. And they had to expand the right one like twice as big as the left because radiation sh pulls the skin up and shrinks them. And so um, it was so, very weird. So you're having radiation while you were getting these tissue expanders, getting the saline. This was all. Mm -hmm. So this was, this was all. This was your summer of 2021 is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't great. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. So it was. Um, I, I think I saw. I think the first uh, fill was. And that's what that's done by the plastic surgeon um, was maybe two weeks afterward. And I had I remember this one day I had. Um, a meeting with my oncologist for the first time after the surgery and after the pathology was done. I'd had a, a, I just had a meeting with Dr. Rivera about the pathology. And then later that day, I was going to meet with the radiation oncologist. And I was just like, it, it was just, bam, it was too much. Yeah. Like I was like on complete overdrive. My nervous system was thrashed. Um, but um, how much radiation and, and so, did you have? Oh, too much. <laughs> I, <laughs> That's a great I, answer. No, it's okay. <laughs> well, I didn't realize. So everybody always said radiation was the easiest part, right? If you've had chemo, you can. That depends. Right, I'm still it's thinking, different right? for everyone. So a lot of people, they have like a zap and then they're done. Like mm -hmm. it takes them longer to get positioned for the, the beams to, to hit the right places. Um, and they were done in 15 minutes. Like it took them longer to park. Mine was 45 minutes. I had eight spots that they radiated wow. and yeah. And it was, um, and it's not normal. Like that's not what normally happens, but because my lymph nodes were so deep, um, my radiation oncologist explained to me that, um, that she would rather damage my skin than my heart. And I was like, okay, cool. I really appreciate that. <laughs> That's, you know, we can fix the skin, yeah. um, but the heart, you can't. And so um, there were just so many, they really wanted to get the lymph nodes. Yeah. And so I'll back up and give you good news. That one lymph node he took was the only one with cancer. Oh, that is good All news. The, the, the other 10, because he took 11, it turned out with the pathology. Um, the other 10 had no, no um, signs of cancer. And we also figured out that the chemo had very little effect. There was a little bit of scarring on the tumor, teeny bit, like a like a millimeter on one side, um, and it had no effect on the lymph nodes. And so I was I, that was a really hard piece for me to digest because I had I had probably put on forty pounds through the um, just all the all the treatment, all of the um, the swelling, all of the steroids, and. Prior to that, I had lost 65 pounds and was in the best shape of my life when I found my tumor. And it was just rude. <laughs> I'll be honest. It was rude. <laughs> it was rude. And so um so that was that I really had to 
just, I had to really embrace that all these micro cells that were floating around were gone. Yeah. I had to really see that as, as the, the silver lining. And we also found out that the tumor wasn't 2.7 centimeters. It was three and a half. And so I don't know if it grew during that time. I don't, and MRIs can be inaccurate. I mean, they're obviously not seeing it firsthand, right. you know, um, and that, you know, I really did need radiation and they, they wanted to, because I had lymph node involvement, they really wanted to get all of, you know, all of the spots. So it was any, it was from like, um, it was a quadrant from like below my, maybe a little bit below my chin or mid throat, um, all the way over to my shoulder and then down around back and back up through the middle of my chest. And how many um, radiation treatments did you have? Uh, 32. So it was six weeks. When I say I got the full MD Anderson experience, like, I don't think there was much that I missed. <laughs> <laughs> I got the six weeks of chemo. Checking the boxes. <laughs> okay. That's really funny. Oh, yeah. And so, but the good piece to that, and it, here's Pollyanna on this, you know, is that anybody who is going through this, I can help them because I've been through the majority of it. Now, I was estrogen positive. There are all kinds of different variations sure. of breast cancer. And what's really interesting about it is it kind of unravels or it kind of, uh, what's a better word is um, it exposes itself a little like along the way. So first you find out that you have cancer, then you find out at stage three, then you, you know you find out more and more and more. And there's never a dull day. It, there's, you know, you never, there's always something going on. And so I had really extreme burns from the radiation. And um, to the point where they gave me the same medication uh, for the radiation burns as they did for um, after my mastectomy, because wow. uh, I couldn't. Yeah, it was it was pretty bad. So, um, but you know, I just look at it and I'm like, I got through that. Yeah, you know, and it was all really fast. I mean, within nine months. Okay. I had gone through all of that. When did you have the reconstruction? The reconstruction was June twenty second. Okay, so pretty soon yeah. after radiation, it was. Mm -hmm. Oh no, the it was after right after chemo. Yeah. Okay. So what I realized is that there's a sweet spot. Doctor Rivera told me a sweet spot for the surgery between um, two weeks after and thirty days. Um, that if it goes past thirty days, he you know he it, it it's a problematic for him. And before two weeks, your immune system isn't ready for it yet. So wait, did you have, so, I'm just, I'm trying to like get the timeline. So did you have the reconstruction yeah, before or after radiation? Before. 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 So yeah, so it was chemo from um, July 11th to June 2nd. The mastectomy and reconstruction was on um, June 22nd. And I began radiation uh, the beginning of August. Okay. And, and finished at the end of uh, September. And how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Um, I had uh, two more reconstruction surgeries, and so they did a they did the implant exchange this past March, and then uh, they did a fat transfer um, to uh, make it more rounded, to make the the breast more rounded, so it didn't just look like I had my chest and then a half a grapefruit on it, right? right? So it, it had you know. So anyway, um, I'm doing well. The um, biggest problem that I still have um, is the results from chemo. And um, I had really horrible neuropathy oh, um, about a year ago right now. It started in my feet uh, and to the place where I was falling down, like literally like falling. Um, and so I had to kind of watch that. So the neuropathy cleared up, but what happened is the fascia in my feet and ankles just was bound and I lost structure in my feet because of it. And, um, mm -hmm. what is that and so exactly? I had like my arches fell. It just like my, my foot, when I went to a sports, uh, sports physical therapist, he just said, your foot just kind of dangles. I mean, it, if it, there weren't bones, it's just kind of dangling there wow. and it doesn't, yeah. So all the, all the muscles, all of that stuff were kind of messed up. And because the fascia was so bound, I had, <laughs> this is ridiculous. I had strained Achilles tendons. Oh, gee. And so, oh, cause if you think about it, it's everything's pulling down. Right. And so all your muscles are super tight. And so, um, 
I got some special arches and, and all of that. And I, um, I mean, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but I actually have a handicap placard yeah. because it's so painful to walk from sure. you know place to place. But the sports therapist really helped me to get uh, rid of the, the plantar fasciitis and all of that. And I just have, I think I have a, a routine that's about two to three hours a day of stretching and exercises to strengthen everything and to keep my, you know, and massage stuff like a massage gun thing and all that. So that's, I mean, that's the biggest residual piece aside from my obvious brain fog. <laughs> and it's, it's, <laughs> um, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm blaming the brain fog forever. I don't care if I'm 85 with dementia, it's the brain fog from chemo. <laughs> um, and, but you know, I, um, I'm healthy. I went, I saw my oncologist and, um, Dr. Ali and Dr. Rivera, the surgeon, uh, about two weeks apart in August. And they both said, you are really healthy right now. Kristen. Oh, that's great. You are really healthy. So, um, I had a scan. It's such great news. Um, I had a scan last March. Um, and it was because I had a little bit of a scare and it was perfect. Oh, that's great. So, yeah. It's so, you know, I'm going to attribute that to positivity and to um, my incredible medical team. Kristen, let me ask you, yeah. what is one mm -hmm. thing you wish you had known at the very beginning of your cancer journey? Because you came into this as some, with some experience with your mom, mm -hmm. um, but what about you? What, what do you wish you had known? Um, I should have seen it with my mom especially, but I didn't, um, that cancer doesn't go away, that it's not like having an ACL surgery where you do all the things they tell you and then it's better or it's 95% better. Right. Um, and I'm not trying to be gloom and doom, but you know, we're cancer free till we're not. And that's, that was, it was put that way by my surgeon and he, he has, he, he had cancer. He's in remission from cancer. So he can talk, he can speak that language. And so I wish I would have known, um, that when you're out of chemo, you can still have problems from it a year later, you know, um, that it doesn't really, you're never the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, and, and you see things for, in a different way. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that it, it and, and I'm not trying to be negative about it. You know, I, I feel like, again, I'm still surprised I had cancer, <laughs> you know, um, and that I'm a breast cancer survivor now or whatever, however people want to talk about that. Um, that's, you know, it, it's something that always is, um, I don't live with a fear of recurrence. I live with a respect oh, that if I, I don't that. take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I love that. Like, respect. That, it's, it's a, it's a respect that, you know, I got to stay on my game. Yeah. But yeah. if it were to recur, that doesn't mean I did anything wrong. You know, of course, cause a oh lot God, of people of think, not. no, I know. But a lot of people think, what did you do to get cancer? You must've been obese. You must've been unhealthy. You must've been, you know, like, um, and there's people who get lung cancer who never smoke. Of course. So, you know, so, yeah. um, yeah, that's, that's probably the, the, the thing I, you know, yeah. Okay. And if you could only do one thing to improve healthcare in the U.S., what would it be and why? Well, um, I know there are a lot of arenas where things need to be changed. I know, and you get one. <laughs> I know, dang it. Um, and this is something I feel pretty passionate about is that um, I was diagnosed, I had dense breasts, right? And I would, I guess the one thing I would do is make MRIs standard for people who have dense breasts, who have certain criteria because mammograms are going to find a lot of it, but there are, um, and a lot of, a lot of people think that if they don't have a history of it, that they don't have to worry about it, or maybe they can skip their mammograms or something. And that's not, it's not true. Only about 10 to 15 people with breast cancer have a history in their family. Right. And so, yeah. So, um, you know, I would say find, find a way to, I don't want to say standardize, but not make it a grueling procedure or an out-of-pocket expense yeah. to get an MRI. Because to me, I had a mammogram, then an ultrasound, then another mammogram, right? And so I'm betting that the cost of that is probably the same as the MRI, Yeah, you know? And 
So, I mean, I, that's what I would do that okay. and, and make it, have it covered by insurance. And that's and because that's, it's, it's personal, you know? Yeah. I love the specificity of that. Thank you for listening to Breast Cancer Stories. To continue telling this story and helping others, we need your help. All podcasts require resources, and we have a team of people who produce it. There's costs involved, and it takes time. If you believe in what we're doing and have the means to support the show, you can make a one-time donation, or you can set up a recurring donation in any amount through the PayPal link on our website at breastcancerstoriespodcast.com slash donate. To get the key takeaways from each episode, links to anything we've talked about, and promo codes or giveaways from our partners, sign up for our email newsletter. If you've been listening to us for a while, you know we are cynical Gen Xers who approach everything with a healthy dose of skepticism. So you can also expect that from us in our newsletter. You'll get notes and thoughts from me related to each episode and links to the most useful resources for all the breast cancer things. So if you have chemo brain, you'll be able to just go read your email, find anything we talked about on the podcast without having to remember it. The link to sign up is in your show notes and on the newsletter page at breastcancerstoriespodcast.com. We promise not to annoy you with too many emails. Thanks for listening to Breast Cancer Stories. There's a link in the show notes with all of the resources mentioned on this episode and more info about how you can donate. If you're facing a breast cancer diagnosis and you want to tell your story on the podcast, send an email to hello at theaxis.io. I'm Eva Shea, your host and executive producer. Production support for the show comes from Mary Ellen Clarkson, and our engineer is Daniel Cruiser. Breast Cancer Stories is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.